Hello, hello, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Give us a wave when you've arrived. Thanks for being here. Hello. Oh, good. I love faces. It took a minute for them to all to pop up. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Thanks for being here. Hi. Yes. Um, wonderful. Well, um, we've only got an hour, so we're just gonna dive right in. But um, before we do, just a little a little obvious hello and welcome. Um you are currently tuning in to the Nuns and Nuns Land Justice Project's webinar on canon law and land justice, so alienating property as a religious community. Um, we have Sister Sharon Ewart with us today. We're so excited to introduce her in a few moments um, and grateful for her expertise. As many of you already know well, the mission of the Nuns and Nuns Land Justice Project is to create land transitions rooted in ecological and racial healing. We work with a group of several religious communities, um, sisters, to incorporate land justice into their property plans. And I see um, a few of our focus communities and prospective focus communities with us right now. Thanks for being here. And today we'll be demystifying some of the technical side of selling or gifting property as a religious community as it relates to canon law. And so again, so grateful to have Sister Sharon with us today and I'll introduce her in a moment. But first, um, given, given the moment we are in, um, I thought that we might start with some, some poetry, a, a, a balm for, the, for our spirits. Um, I find that poetry can sometimes speak to things that feel unspeakable. So this is a poem by um, Aurora Levens Morales called Summons. Aurora is a um, Puerto Rican Jewish poet, um, feminist, writer, historian. And um, this is a poem that's been uh, circulating the last few weeks and I'll share with you now. Summons. Last night I dreamed 10,000 grandmothers from the 1200 corners of the earth walked out into the gap. One breath deep, between the bullet and the flesh, between the bomb and the family. They told me we cannot wait for governments. There are no peacekeepers boarding planes. There are no leaders who dare to say every life is precious. So it will have to be us. They said we will cup our hands around each heart. We will sing the earth song, the song of water a song so beautiful that vengeance will turn to weeping. The mourners will embrace and grief replace every impulse toward harm. 10,000 is not enough, they said. So we have sent this dream like a flock of doves into the sleep of the world. Wake up, put on your shoes. You who are reading this, I am bringing bandages and a bag of scented guavas from my trees. I think I remember the tune. Meet me at the corner. Let's go. <sighs> Thank you to Aurora Levens Morales for that um, incredible poem. And in the spirit of meeting at whatever corner we're at right now, um, Let's go, let's go. This is this is our commitment um, as we walked together towards land justice. Um, may we may we carry the spirit of this poem and and poems like it uh, as we as we discern how to move forward in ecological and racial healing. So I'm going to kick it over to Sharon in just a moment. Um, but before we do, I just want to briefly introduce her, though I don't think she needs much introduction with this room. Um, uh, Sharon Ewart, RSM, is a Sister of Mercy of the Americas. 
She is a canon lawyer and currently serves as the executive director of the Resource Center for Religious Institutes in Silver City, Silver Spring, um, Maryland. And she has prepared a presentation for us uh, that we will um, kind of pass, pass the mic over to her. And then we'll open up for some Q&A. Um, so please keep in mind what kinds of questions uh, you would like to ask. Um, you can write them down for yourself or you can send them to Amy um, in the chat, who's gonna be our tech person today, she's waving. And um, we will make sure that uh, we get to those at the end of the our hour together. So without further ado, I think I'm going to spotlight you, Sharon. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much, Sarah. I'm I'm really grateful for this opportunity, and I'm I'm excited about sharing information about canon law and what's involved in an alienation process for religious institutes that may be considering a land justice property plan. Um, I have an introduction. I have some slides with some introduction and also. Um, information around the alienation process and stable patrimony. And I will leave those slides with Sarah if um, they want to make them available available to you. So I'm going to share screen now. If I do it correctly. Can everybody see the screen? Great. Oh. <laughs> okay, the work, I wanna begin with something about just the works of the ministries of religious institutes. Our expressions of mission, Historically, the apostolic works changed in response to new needs and assumed different expressions according to societal, cultural, and religious geographic context. In some instances, longstanding ministries are no longer consistent with the new expressions of mission and properties can no longer serve new ministries as an expression of charism. Today, leaders of religious institutes in addressing realities around sponsorship of ministries and demographics of membership hold, uh, uh, are confronted with challenges and decisions regarding the stewardship of ecclesiastical temporal goods. Stewardship of temporal goods involves managing, safeguarding, and administering the assets and properties of religious institutes in accord with canon and civil law. The church in canon 1254 holds and administers temporal goods to serve the mission entrusted to it by Jesus Christ. In other words, In other words, the ecclesial nature of these temporal goods is founded on the proper ends and mission of the church. This understanding is reflected in the principle that church property never belongs to an individual person. Rather, it always belongs to a public juridic person to be used for the purposes and mission entrusted to that juridic person. Canon 1256 states that the temporal goods belong to the public juridic person that has legitimately acquired them. So what is ecclesiastical goods? Oops. Ecclesiastical goods simply stated are sometimes referred to as ecclesiastical property. And these are the temporal goods belonging to a public juridic person, such as a diocese, a parish, a religious institute, 
a ministerial public juridic person that are re required to carry out a specific mission. A religious institute becomes a public juridic person by law with the approval of its constitutions by church authority. Just a few words about what a public juridic person is because it may be a new term to some viewers. A public juridic person is often defined by its characteristics. It is a construct of canon law. It's an artificial entity of persons or things which has both rights and obligations in the church. It is established either by the law itself or by decree of competent church authority to carry out a mission entrusted to it in the name of the church. It is perpetual unless it is legitimately suppressed. Its assets are ecclesiastical uh, property governed by canon law. And a public juridic person participates in the mission of the church and is recognized as Catholic. It must maintain communion with the church and is subject to some degree of oversight by church authority. The persons for which juridic persons are created, the purpose for which juridic per persons are created pertain to works of piety, the apostolate or charity, whether it's um, spiritual or corporal. The notion of a public juridic person is important for understanding the relationship of a religious institute to temporal goods belonging to that institute. For example, the secular understanding of ownership is not used to describe this relationship, but rather the ecclesiastical goods, the temporal goods are entrusted to the religious institute for specific purposes. In this way, the religious institute becomes the canonical steward of the ecclesiastical goods. So what are the laws on temporal goods of religious institutes? In general, the church's laws governing the temporal goods belonging to religious are found in the canons on religious institutes that refer to temporal goods in the church. They're also found in the canons of Book 5 of the Code of Canon Law, which is totally on temporal goods, and the proper law of each institute. Specifically, the canons govern four elements of ownership of temporal goods. I'm not going to read the canon numbers, but you can, you can see them here. Acquisition of temporal goods administration of temporal goods, alienation of temporal goods, and then another category of pious wills and trusts. So what kind of transaction could change the relationship of temporal goods to the religious institute? Let's look briefly at the procedures for alienation of temporal goods a process that is carried out in the administration of an institute's property. The term comes from the Latin alienare, which means to make something another's. The procedure for alienation or the procedures are outlined in the canons 638, as well as 1291 to 1294. So what is alienation of property? Alienation is the conveyance or transfer of ownership of ecclesiastical goods to another. It's a very simple definition, a transfer of ownership. This can be carried out by sale, gift, exchange, or other recognized means. Alienation of ecclesiastical goods is subject to the procedures outlined in the canons I just mentioned. Alienation, however, is restricted in two ways. The first restriction is that the property to be alienated, 
alienated, that is transferred uh, to another, must be part of the Institute's stable patrimony. And the second restriction occurs when the value of that property exceeds the maximum limits set by the Holy See for the region. So let's look first at what is stable patrimony. The first restriction is that the property must be part of the Institute's stable patrimony. The technical definition of stable patrimony is all property, real or personal, movable or immovable, tangible or intangible, that either by its nature or by explicit designation is destined to remain in the possession of the owner for a long or indefinite period to afford financial stability and security for the future. For religious institutes, stable patrimony often refers to immovable property and fixed capital that has a monetary value and is intended for the long-term security of the Institute's mission, apostolic works or ministries, and its members. Examples of stable patrimony for religious institutes include real estate, such as land and buildings, other types of property, such as historical or cultural property, long-term investments in stocks, bonds, treasury notes, endowments, restricted funds that are set aside for a specific purpose, such as pension funds, ministry or educational funds. These assets would generally be designated as stable patrimony. Such a designation is ordinarily made when the assets are acquired by the religious institute. The designation could be explicit or implicit if the property is ordinarily acquired for a long period of time, such as land and buildings. An implicit designation would consist in treating the property, land, buildings, etc., as stable and protecting it from various forms of loss. Sometimes we can look back at council minutes leadership and team minutes uh, for a verification that would provide some indication as to the original intention of the administrators of the public juridic person. Now, some examples of property that may not be stable patrimony. A medical office or perhaps even a parking lot built on the campus of a healthcare facility. Land and buildings received through a legacy which the Institute does not wish to retain, cash on hand or available in banks for daily maintenance of the, of the Institute, funds that are earmarked for future projects, but they haven't been set aside for a particular purpose. And then obsolete goods, such as computers, healthcare equipment. So what happens if the property is not designated explicitly or implicitly as stable patrimony? The designation of stable patrimony was not a canonical requirement prior to the 1983 Code of Canon Law. And the reason was that it was not necessary since the previous code required all church property to be designated as stable patrimony. But following the, the promulgation of the revised code, many religious institutes did not designate whether newly acquired property was stable patrimony. 
And if the property is not designated stable patrimony explicitly or implicitly, it is not subject to the norms on alienation. Since it's not always clear whether a particular asset or parcel of property was intended to be stable patrimony, Canon 1283 prescribes that administrators of juridic persons, such as the leadership of a religious institute, prepare an up-to-date inventory of the temporal goods to be administered. And the canon identifies three categories of property to be listed. Immovable property, movable objects, which are precious uh, or of cultural value, and other goods. It often happens that institutes need such an appraisal for insurance purposes, sometimes even taking photos. At the same time, um, these photos can be helpful in identifying newly acquired stable patrimony. But the inventory is important since it can distinguish between those goods which are part of stable patrimony and those which are not. But the distinction is really very, very important because as I mentioned, temporal goods that are not part of the stable patrimony, and this is the key, that are not intended for the long-term support of the Institute and its mission are not subject to the procedures for alienation. However, this does not mean that the Institute leaders are free to do with them whatever they want. Such goods can are still and can be still ecclesiastical goods and subject to the canons on extraordinary administration, which um, the norms would be would often be found in the proper law of the sponsoring institute. Now, examples of alienation today. Among the signs of the times are complex decisions about assets and property belonging to religious institutes that may include transfer of ownership and alienation. The following are current examples. First, the transfer of the title of property to another, and this could be to another institute, an organization, a diocese. Secondly, spending a portion of all immobilized goods, that is all real property, for a purpose different from the one for which it was immobilized, such as land and buildings. Sale of historical or precious works. Now, here are some canonical sources for um, patrimony alienation of patrimony. The guidelines in 2018 from the Dicastery for Institutes of Consecrated Life identifies in, an, in a document called Economy at the Service of Charism and Mission, identifies those elements that constitute the stable patrimony as a means of a su sustaining the life of the Institute and the realization of the church's mission. The guidelines define stable patrimony and affirm the procedure in Canon 1283 uh, requiring the leadership of public juridic persons um, to prepare the inventory of the designated assets that constitute stable patrimony. And again, for an asset to be con considered a part of stable patrimony of a public juridic person, a legitimate designation is required. The second restriction on alienation of temporal goods concerns the value of the property whether and whether it exceeds the maximum amount set by the Holy See. The limits will vary from country to country or region to region. The current limits 
for the United States of stable, patrimony, uh, of stable patrimony in the United States, which is set by the Holy See, above which the approval of the dicastery for institutes of consecrated life is required for validity, are based on the number of Catholics in the diocese in which the property is located. And there are two levels. If the diocese where the property is located has fewer than a half a million Catholics, the limit is $5,705,000. If the diocese has more than 500,000 Catholics, the limit is 11,408,000. 11, the number of Catholics can be found in the official Catholic directory under the listing of each diocese. Sometimes it can also be found on the website of the diocese where the property is located. Now, here are a few guidelines or steps when you're discerning divesting your temporal goods um, or your property. First, determine if the transaction is a transfer of ownership. If it is a transaction, whether it is by sale, gift, or exchange. If so, determine if the property is stable patrimony. If it is not stable patrimony, the alienation norms do not apply. However, consider proper law and the procedure for extraordinary acts of extraordinary administration. If the property is stable patrimony, determine the value of the property to be alienated by means of two property assessments. One could be a county tax value. If the value of the property that is required um, if the value of the property exceeds, it, it, um, what I'm trying to say now, if it is the value of the property that's important, not the sale price in terms of the Holy See. So if the value of the, it's the value that you have to look at, not a sale price. So if the value of the property is below the maximum set by the dicastery for the alienation of property for the region, uh, where it is located, the procedures found in the Institute's proper law should be followed, including the written permission of the superior or the president with the consent of the council as required in Canon 638. That is if the value is below the maximum set by Rome. If the value of the property is above the maximum set by the dicastery, for alienation of property, the norms on alienation should be followed. Now, among the documents required to accompany the petition for alienation is the written votum of the diocesan bishop of the diocese where the property is located. Now, a votum is a statement of opinion from the diocesan bishop regarding the petition. It is not an approval. An unfavorable votum does not necessarily mean that the petition will be denied. There are occasions when a petition with an unfavorable votum is approved by the Holy See. More often, there is dialogue between and among the Holy See, the bishop, and the religious institute. However, the more informed the bishop is about the Religious Institute, its ministry in the diocese, and the circumstances of the transaction, the more likely the votum will be favorable. Now, here's a sample petition of the uh, contents of a petition to alienate property. In the beginning, it would be presented to the dicastery in the name of the prefect. Who, who is the applicant and what is the purpose of this request. Then there's an introduction, the name of the congregation, 
a description of the property to be sold, its use, and the burden to keep. And this is this is kind of important. What the burden to keep is what's the cost of of of, of keeping this property? That is, what's the burden on the cost of upkeep? You no longer need it. It's too large for the members. So those are important factors to be included in the petition. The purpose of the transaction, that is the rationale. Why, what's your reason for the petition? Any existing indebtedness, if there is any. Um, then a formal request for permission to alienate. Who are the consultants? Legal, canonical, real estate, uh, appraisers a brokerage, financial, some may be different, but these are just some examples of what might be in uh, consultants. And then as exhibits, you might have the valuations, the financial statements of the Institute, perhaps the latest audit report, um, an exhibit on, and now the, I have the word consent here, but it's not really the consent, it should be the votum of the local ordinary of the diocesan bishop. And it's the consent of the religious institute. And this means if you are a province, you need the consent, you need the permission of the superior and the consent of the council. Then that, that is sent, the excerpt of the minutes of that meeting of the provincial and the council is sent to the superior general. Then the superior general and her council must also give consent and then send it on to Rome. So the excerpt from the minutes, when that permission and consent is given, are also part of the documentation. I will have to change, um, Sarah, I'm going to change that that bottom line consent to the opinion votum of the ordinary, okay? Sounds good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now, the procedures for requesting approval for alienation can be found as a resource. It's a, it's a document that outlines each step on RCRI's website. Um, on the home page, it's in two places. On the home page, there's a big green block that says latest news. And in there are two items under frequently requested questions, the limits for alienation and the procedures. And you can click on them and you they'll come up. Another resource we have that is also on there is 25 questions and answers regarding temporal goods of religious institutes. And that is on the website. It's also in that box, but there's another link where you can go directly, directly to it. So that's, that's all I have in terms of giving you an overview um, and we're happy to answer questions or um, more further explanation on any of the any of the things that I presented. So, thank you. Well, thank you, Sharon. Maybe some some applause in the in the gallery. <laughs> you don't need to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I I thank you for that presentation. Um, we are going to open up for some questions. We have some lined up already. Um, and, you know, I just want to encourage, I imagine for a lot of sisters, some of, some of this, this vocabulary is familiar, but if it's, if it's not, you know, please, please chime in um, with questions. I know for me, I'm like, whoa, these are some <laughs> wild words. Um, uh, so, so no question is too small. Um, so there was some there are a few questions related to kind of digging more into like what's considered stable patrimony, some questions related to value. Um, I'm just gonna start, yeah, thro throwing them your way. Um uh in terms of stable patrimony, um, I'm just kind of like gonna reflect back what I like heard that that it is that which gives a religious community financial security for the future. And that that the kinds of properties that but is not intended as stable patrimony are not subject to the procedures of alienation. Um, I guess one question I have is 
how, when you say that, you know, um, religious institutes need to determine what stable patrimony is when they're looking to alienate property, how much control do religious communities have in defining for themselves or determining for themselves what stable patrimony is like that, which they need. Um, and there's kind of a, a sub question, but I'll, I'll start with that one. Well, if in some instances, it's already going to be designated stable patrimony. If it's something that has been there for a long time, for example, mother houses are definitely stable patrimony. When they were built and founded, they were intended for long-term use. And um, that the and and not maybe not for the financial stability, but certainly for the mission of the institute. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to look at those two things. And that's often what we see what uh, religious wanting um, to divest themselves of these states. It are, are properties, mm -hmm. houses, land and buildings related to mother houses. Um, mm -hmm. and as, and as I mentioned, you have to look also on that whole campus because if you have newer buildings that were like the medical office building or a parking lot, um, those are not, those are probably not intended for the financial stability of the Institute or for mission. There's a judgment. There is clearly a judgment in things that are not explicitly designated but are more implicit in their designation. And, and so when it comes to building in lands, that's where it's it becomes a real discernment on the part of both leadership and members on what does this mean? Um, and then what do they wanna do with it? What do they, how do they wanna preserve it if they are not going to be the owner? Now the value mm -hmm. is, is, a, is a really a technical thing because having to know the value is also a way that enables religious to give things away as gift. Um, because you can do that. You don't have to, everything doesn't have to be sold. But the value also has to reflect um, not only the current value, but what's going to happen to it in the future. For example, if a community wants to give away property. The question they have to ask is, will this transaction jeopardize the financial condition, future financial condition of the Institute? Are we gonna need this land to sell at another point in time? And if we do, then that's a serious discernment. If you don't, then it's, much, it's a much easier decision. But it's the value. It's not the sale price. Even if you're not going to sell it, it's still the value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a question about, about the two questions about value. Um, one is more of a technical question. Are these value limits per property item or the total property assets alienated per year or per transaction? There... There are times when an institute tries to break up the property so it doesn't reach the threshold that they have to go to Rome. And that's not the intention of the, of the procedures. You can, you know, as a community, you, it, you, don't get an, you don't get an immediate reply to these kinds of petitions. Besides, it takes quite a while to put together the packet. So I wouldn't call this a frequent action on the part of institutes. But if there is a property that is clearly dividable, I don't know if that's a word, divisible, I think is a word, um, then um, that can be done. Like right now we're ready to sell. I suppose the property is, 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 is broken up by a street. There's ownership on both um, property on both sides of the street. Now we're ready to divest ourselves of the property on the right-hand side um, because we still have the mother house and property on the other side. That's that's permissible, but it wouldn't be, you know, we'll do the backyard this year and we'll do the side yards next year. Do you see you see the difference? That's, that's mm -hmm. what I <laughs> Yeah, okay. Um, 
One, one person asks, how do you value a property that no one wants to buy? We might have a property that is technically valued above the designated amount, but we cannot sell it at that amount. And the burden of keeping it is exorbitant. So it would be sold at a de minimis amount, well below the valued price. Well, that's exactly what goes into the petition. That okay. you cannot sell it at its value. Um, it, it may be possible to sell it at a lower value, um, but it's not attractive. Now, I, I remember working with one community that they they had a lot of property. And when they had it assessed, it was wetlands. It was worth two hundred dollars. And and they couldn't sell it. Um, so I think those are things that just go, you know, is it's it's the value. And that that wetland was only valued at two hundred dollars, even though it was many acres. So the it, you know, I think it would still go into into the petition. And really, Rome mm -hmm. isn't as interested in the sale price because lots of times people don't even know what it is, what it might be. Um, they might be interested if you know what the use of it is. They're very important. They're very interested in what, how it will be used because the property has been church property. And there's a concern on the part of the church that it not be used for functions and for purposes contrary to the church's teaching. In other words, they would not approve the alienation of a building that would be used as an abortion clinic. Th that's that's what they mean by use. When it's used for you know things like um, low income housing, um, uh, you know th uh, all kinds of things that are consistent with particularly consistent with the mission of the community. That's when it's really a you know, a really wonderful experience for everybody. Mm -hmm. I, I guess this is like a two-part question. Um, can you give an example of a time when the Holy See went with an unfavorable votum from a bishop? Like, in other words, have you, have you seen a bishop successfully block a mission-aligned alienation? Well, and I... Ha the, or how did that happen? I worked with, with one... Um, where the bishop said no. And in fact, he sent his own letter over to Rome. He didn't, the letter should go with the packet. And um, so the community still submitted its petition. And the Holy See contacted the nuncio in this country and communicated through him to the bishop. You know, they wanted to know more why his reasons, what his reasons were. And there was some misunderstanding on his part. He, he thought that he had not been approached and asked if he wanted it, but he was through his Catholic charities and they said no. Oh. So the sisters didn't think the diocese was interested in it. So they didn't pursue any more with the bishop. Did he want it or was he interested in it? He knew about it being you know they had contacted him given him information about its it's being for sale and then a re and then after that kind of uh, conversation between the bishop and the community he did give a he did give his approval it was being um, used it was being used for a good purpose yeah yeah i, I imagine it's hard to argue with a good, good purpose um mm -hmm. <laughs> what and kind of along those lines, what's what's most important to include in your petition? Just to like really, it sounds like you just like kind of have to make the case that you do. This is going oh, yeah. to be used. This is this is in alignment with who we are, with our charism. Um, this is who we're called to be, and like give also a, the financial picture. Like this is what's needed. Um, that that's you're absolute absolutely right, Sarah. The the main thing is this is why we're doing this, and this is where the burden comes in. We can no longer support this. Mm -hmm. And and if you know how it will be used, here's how it be used. It's consistent with our mission, our values as, as a sister, our charism. It's consistent with our charism. Um, it's supported, it's supported by our members to the extent your chapter, uh, however, whoever's been involved in the consultation on it. And and the bishop, 
And very often the bishop supports this too. So the Kate, you make a case for it. And um, mm -hmm. I would have to say, I, I'm not aware of many that have been, I, I, personally, I don't know of any that have said no. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's helpful um, and hopeful. I have, I, I think we wanna probably open things up soon for folks who want to, um, yeah, ask their own questions, but I have two more questions that feel like they're kind of back to this question about like what counts. Um, I have two questions from two different people um, and I'm just gonna share both of them because maybe they're kind of similar. Um, one is, uh, does property and funds owned by a corporation that is a sponsored ministry of the religious institute and for which the institute is the member, are those funds and land considered stable patrimony? Um, so if the institute separates from that ministry, can the land and funds go with it without concern for alienation? Um, so the land is part of the separate corporation, like the school or the university. Um, I, I believe it would not be considered, even though you're the members, you make the decision on what will happen to it. But I believe when the separating corporation, usually the, the, the civil corporation holds the property of that. Mm -hmm. So it, it wouldn't be considered the property of the religious institute itself. That would be my understanding, unless there's, there's some other kind of clause written into it okay okay and then this is from another this is from another community that we work with what percentage and i yeah i'm just gonna ask it what percentage of ministry of the congregation needs to be performed on the land to be considered church land does it need to be considered church land if ministry work is on it or can it just be any land held by a congregation it would be I think, any, yeah it would be any land that the congregation owns whether there's a building on it or anything Okay. It could be wetlands. Right, right. <laughs> um, and I see this from Eleanor uh, Craig in the in the chat. What is the length of time it generally takes to make a petition and receive a final decision? Well, it could take a while to put everything together, getting your getting the valuation, um, and it just making it's a big packet. It's a pretty big packet when you put it all together, the financial records and the valuations, Bodum. Um, it depends on the return. Um, it depends if it's if it's very clear and everything is in place. Um, if it's written well, and I, you know, I suggest in terms of even making sections. You know, not just a just not just like. 10 pages of a letter, like, here's this, here's this, here's that. And then they can, you know, they can find it. And some exhibits. Exhibits are, are good because you don't want to put all the financial statements in between two items. So if you put some of those things at the end and just keep the text as, as explaining briefly what each is and where it is, it's easier for Rome to read. Uh, to read. But if there is an urgency, in other words, you have a buyer, but they're waiting. To, you're waiting to see if you can alienate it. You can say that, and you know. And my understanding is they do try to get back to you as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, and I would also say I if there is a way you can either hand deliver it with somebody mm -hmm. in Rome, if you have somebody in Rome that can take the packet right over there, that. That's really good. Um, I wouldn't email it because it's too much. It's going to be too long. If you mail it, I, I always recommend sending it through the nunciature because they follow it. And they send over every week a special, you know, bag, I guess it is, of all the mail that goes over to Rome and then it's distributed to the right dicasteries. And then they can follow up for you. Did it get there? When did it get there? That kind of thing. Wonderful. Well, I'm going to unpin us and go back to gallery view. And if anyone has questions and you just want to raise your hand or come off mute, um, 
yeah, we, we'd love to open up for other folks' questions. I have more questions, but um, want to get some other voices in here. Ooh, Brittany, do you want to ask your question? I, uh, what's the word? Yield to the sisters in the room. <laughs> I'll ask mine if no one else has any. Well, I'll just, I'll ask real quick. Um, this one. This someone. Oh, there we go. Great. Ruthie. Okay. I I'm going to ask Brittany's question. <laughs> You have a sample of a well done petition. I always knew I liked you, Sister Ruthie. Yeah, right. So, I mean, actually, the outline that I put on there, I took from one that was approved. Okay, could could you send us that sample with the other stuff you're sending? I'd, I'd have to get their permission. Okay, because I don't, it, you know, it's 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 pretty private. Okay, well, maybe you could check. Yeah. Thank you. And if there are folks on the call that have had a successful petition, that's something the Land Justice Project could offer is like making anonymous the details of it, but creating some resources that communities can share. I, I'm putting that as an idea. I know that's like sensitive information, but it's like, how could we make general the more sensitive things? Um, just putting that seed in the ground. Have, been, have any of you on here alienated property? This, this is Gemma from uh, Dominican Sisters of Peace. And yes, we've, we've alienated uh, many years ago hospitals that were over the limit and had to get the uh, alienation approved by the bishops and all the dioceses where they were, That's right. et cetera, yeah. et cetera. And actually, it's, it's a very straightforward process. We, it was not complicated. It just had a lot of detail to it. And it was just kind of following it step by step. It took probably about five months, maybe, to mm -hmm. collect all the appropriate documents, getting get them formatted, and we did hand carry them to Rome. And I think we got the response within maybe six weeks. That's good. Nice. But I think it, every every piece of property is very particular. So it, yeah, that's what I I hesitate to give you any petition because it's different. For, if requesting alienation for land is very different than a building. Um, but maybe just maybe we can spell out each of those categories what you should put in those that might be a little better, more and helpful. And also, much land unless it's a huge tract is going to come underneath the uh, yeah. environments. Unless it's in New York. Well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to pass it. We've got two raised hands, um, Janelle and Sheila. Janelle, you want to ask your question first? And then oh, you, thank Sheila. You. Thank you so much for this workshop. I, I'm a lawyer that supports land return, and I just learned a lot of new words. Um, so it's all sinking in. But I, I guess my question is, if a religious institute wants to gift land for a mission-aligned purpose. So giving up a major asset and that institute knows, actually, we don't know, like the future is uncertain. We don't know if we'll have enough assets to sustain our mission and our organization going forward. But we want to take that risk because we care so much about supporting this other thing. Um, is that is that going to get a lot of pushback from Rome? Is Because it sounds like the, the purpose here is to preserve these assets into the sort of unknowable future, but to sort of embrace the unknown. Can a group do that? It's, it's um, they have to be realistic about it. Rome's main concern will be the care of the members. So if the, the, the decision would jeopardize the future care of their members, if they're underfunded in their retirement funds. Those are the things that have to be considered um, because it's not just an individual that's being affected. It's a whole group of community members that could be affected by that decision. So it's a, it, it's a, it's a weighty decision. So I can't answer that. I think it, it has, it's part of the whole discernment and that's, and that's, that that's, that's real serious. It's real serious. Got it. Thank you. Sheila? Oh, we can't hear you right now. Uh oh. 
Is she muted? Which uh, she's not muted. You're not muted. It might be that your yeah. audio isn't connected. Do you want to type your question into the chat and we can ask it? Wow. Um. Did I just while, hear you? While Sister Sh Sheila types it, um, there is a question from Brenna that I saw. Um, Sister Sharon, you mentioned the case. Yeah. Do you want to say that? I could read it out loud. You had mentioned a case, Sister Sharon, the one that you knew of where a bishop gave an unfavorable vote on because he was under the impression that the community hadn't first offered the land to him or to the diocese. Mm -hmm. So is that generally an expectation that a community... And again, this is always when well, it's over a certain value, um, it, it depending on how it depends. They, um, this was a building. This mm -hmm. was a building um, that had been used at one time. Part of it had been used at one time by the diocese. Um, I think it's I think some religious thing. It depends on the relationship with the bishop, but it's a courtesy. We're selling it. Um, we're going to put it on the market. And if he's interested, he's going to say, well, we might be interested. And I know that in many cases, really, really several cases, the bishops have bought the property at market value in some instances. It a lot depends on their relationship. Okay. Thank you. And again, this is only for communities whose properties are valued above a certain amount, depending on how many Catholics are well, in the area. Well, I would, yes, that's true. But if, if, it's, a, if it's below the amount, it's very important for the Institute to at least notify the Bishop that they're selling it because um, that's, it's, it's, it's part of the sense of communio in that diocese that you inform him and it's the relationship, especially between superiors and bishops. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, I don't know if Sheila was able. I haven't seen a note no, from Sheila. I wasn't. Yeah. There, she can talk. She can talk. We just heard her. Oh, okay. Um, I had a question about a circumstance where a congregation might have two distinct um, properties to sell. Is it best to do it all together or to do uh, each one separately with a uh, waiting for the response from that one? Would it? It would depend on whether. They're being used for the same purpose or being sold to the same, the same um, person, well, or if they're for two different two different sales. If it's two, two different, different sales, sales, I would do them separately. If I if yeah. they're two different sales. Okay, thank you. Um, we have Ladonna with a raised hand. Thank you. Uh, this is just a question about um, the limit of alienation. That number changes, does it not? Um, I know the 500,000 is kind of the number that here's above, here's below for number of Catholics, but that number also seems to change. The value number seems to change occasionally. How often does that change? Well, this one was changed in, uh, I think it was 2010, um, but many religious didn't know about it until 2015. Hmm. Um, because it, I don't know what happened, but it was the reason it is higher. See, the other thing is most countries around the world, the, the, um, threshold for religious is the same as for bishops, but in this country, it's not, it's more the, the religious have more, they have a higher threshold. Mm -hmm. And, and that, as I understand it, was because back in the 2000s, healthcare, healthcare institutions really needed a higher threshold in order to be, otherwise they were going to Rome all the time for port purchases primarily. So it was raised. And so we keep it on our website, but the, if you ask your Bishop what the threshold is, he's gonna give you theirs, thinking that it's the same as theirs, but it is not. I just dealt with a very large diocese recently and the religious told the bishop what their the amounts were and he wouldn't believe them. Mm -hmm. So they had him call me and I said, well, okay, I'll send you what we got from Rome. So I did. I sent him the, you know, the letter. And he said, well, I should have. Why didn't we know this? And I don't know. I, I don't think 
Rome notify, they have no reason. To, see, ours comes from the Congregation for Religious. The bishops level comes from the Congregation for Bishops. In some countries, the Congregation for Lid Religious simply gives the same level, but we don't have it. And to be very honest, we don't want to ask about it now because we'd rather it just stay like it is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Um, Sister Sharon, we're at time, but I'm curious, do you have like a few extra minutes? Um, we've got one more question with Jan sure. and I've got a question from someone who wasn't here um, that feels connected to another in the chat. Uh, that was a yes I heard, right? We're good yes, for five yes. more minutes. Uh, Jan. We cannot hear you right now. Hmm. Shucks. Um, you might not have your uh, audio, your audio uh, connected, but if you want to type it in the chat. In the meantime, um, we had a, a community member from one of our focus communities mention that you know in their community they've been reminded of their congregation's canonical obligations, and as they understood it, like to be three things: care of sisters care of archives, and care of cemeteries. And um, as the land justice team of that community has been drafting parameters for land transitions to present to the entire community, something that they're they're coming, you know, into like into contact with is how these canonical obligations might conflict or or be at odds with other ethical obligations that they feel as a community towards repair and healing, particularly, I think, with Black and Indigenous communities. Um, so I guess, you know, the question that she asked was, you know, are there other things that can be prioritized, like repair and healing through their ministry and charism, you know, that that still, um, that might um, not come at odds with care of cemeteries or, or archives, but might have a different opinion about how that care happens? Well, if you're looking at response, canonical responsibilities, there's a lot more than those three. Yeah. Right. But the primary one is the care of members. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you could put um, the one that they mentioned as 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 prior to that care. Concern. Right, right. But I think just like having both of those things taken care of, like, you know, um, I think it also name it comes into another question of like, how do people creatively, um, like if people have creative ideas about how care of members might happen or how care of archives or cemeteries might happen different than what how they might have been done in the past. I guess I'm curious about that as well. I, I, I don't really know how to answer that. I, I really don't. I mean, I think that I think if there's money involved, if it's a sale, then you can prioritize where the where the uh, the use of the resources. Um, but I I don't know how you how how you would I look at other ways of handling cemeteries and archives that would somehow relate to the the property issue. I I don't I really don't understand the question. I'm sorry. That's okay. She's not maybe here, somebody so, else um, can maybe somebody yeah. else can. But I, I did see that Jan was able to put her question in. Is there a tax on the value above the limit? There's a tax on the petition. And the uh, the tax um, was, I, and I think there are circumstances where it could, you know, that you can um, maybe, maybe negotiate, but it's generally 0.1% on the, on the value. Or if you know the sale, it might be on the sale. Um, all right, Eleanor, you might have the last word here. <laughs> I see your hand is raised. You yeah. know, I better say 0.01. It's not 10%. It, it's 0.01%. <laughs> I think that's it. it, it they, they give it to you. They'll send you an invoice, but there is, there is a tax up on it. I'm just not sure what it is. I know there's a one, but I'm not sure where the zero is. I haven't looked at it recently. Mm -hmm. 
So my my question, um, Sister Sharon, is an awkward one. Um, So much of what the canon law is built around is the mission of the church and the obligation of its members and organizations to um, bring into to um, realization the mission of Jesus Christ. So, um, it, only recently has my community and many others, kind of prodded by nuns and nuns, come to the recognition that a mission we never recognized is now preeminent in our lives. And that's the mission of repair and reconciliation with those very large communities that have been injured directly by the Catholic Church. My own community both were slaveholders and assimilators in the Indian boarding schools. Mm -hmm. And it is crucial to us that we turn our attention and as much of our resources as we can to fulfilling what we regard as a, 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 um, a primary obligation. So in light of that, your answer about whether um, uh, lands that we hold could be used to serve the purpose of reconciliation and repair wasn't very satisfactory to me because you subordinated it so fast to the well-being of the sisters. Whereas in our community, we as the sisters are saying, we have to balance our well-being with this primary obligation, which we incurred by our participation in injury and sin. Well, then that that should be said. It's the sisters who want to do this. Now, and, and, and as long as the sisters can, in a petition, if you do, if you do this, that you can at least say our sisters will not be out on the streets. Oh, for sure. That's all. That's all I was saying. That's all I was saying. That you have some you have some retirement funds to care for them when they need skilled care. That's all. If you have that, then then these other primary aspects of your charism. I don't want to say they're secondary um, because they're very important. But as a religious institute, the the obligation is to care for its members. Can I piggyback off of that? Because I, well, I oh, think, but only only if I get first to say um, my re- reaction, which is, I, we are voluntary members of a voluntary community, and nothing in canon law could make it less voluntary, and we didn't come together to take care of each other. How large is your community, Eleanor? I'm a sister of Loretto. We're 95 vowed members and 200 co-members right now. And we do have a retirement fund, which if you asked us last year would have been fully funded. And this year, of course, it isn't fully funded. I wish trends hadn't come out with a new version quite so soon and had waited until the stock market went back up. But that's so. But so you you are, are you're able to do that. I mean, you've got you've got the you've got the funds now. You say everybody wants this as their priority. Yes. Is everyone capable of making that decision? Oh come on, no. Of course they're of not. Of course not. Okay, so that's my point. That's my point. As long I'm... as those sisters can be cared for, mm-hmm. then your priorities fall in place at following that that's all I was saying Mm -hmm. and I also think to your point like Sharon what I hear you saying is the job that Rome is going to ask you to do is explain how this is aligned with your mission and how sisters will be cared for and Eleanor of course I hear the the ways that those things weave together for you as a sister and I'm with you in that I think Part of this work is all of ours to do as a community, which is to say, what condition, what roads do we create together where that petition you're sending to Rome is saying, here's how we're creating a future in which we don't have to choose between the care of sisters and reparations and reconciliation, right? Um, Like one really clear example of this to me is like, we can, 
if reparations want to be made to a tribe and a community isn't fully funded, which is a term I, anyway, well, I won't go into that, but then adequately, adequately, adequately yes. funded, right? Um, who are the philanthropic funders who are going to support this to happen, this exchange to happen? So I just want to say, I think, like, I think as a community, we can get creative and hold both of these things and make the case. So I don't think, I think that's actually where we get held up is saying, oh, we like, we're not fully funded, so we can't do this instead of we're not adequately funded. So how do we activate more of our relationships so that we can make the adequate petition to Rome? So that's kind of like what I'm learning and hearing in that dialogue between the two of you and Sister Sharon. It's just, it's so helpful to hear, um, just like get a little bit less fuzzy about all of this and hear real examples and stories and bullet points from you because, um, you know, we, we certainly want to support the work of land justice that can move forward and, and be supported by alienation petitions when that is what needs to happen. So thank you so much. And yeah. Eleanor, you know, I love your fire. Thank you. Sharon. <laughs> I, as, as, <laughs> I get fiery, but I also do see some almost irreconcilable contradictions that I, I, I can't help but raise up because other people will feel them too. Hmm. Well, thank you for giving voice to some of the things that will undoubtedly be part of our work moving forward, part of our work together in holding holding both, holding multiple things at once. And um, yeah, I want to thank everyone here for staying a little over for the 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 like nice fiery debate um, and and actually like what felt like a really generative conversation. I really am grateful for that. Um, Sister Sharon, thank you so, 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 so much for offering this presentation. As Brittany says, it's so helpful to, yeah, get, get clear, like be less fuzzy. Um, this has really been illuminating. So, um, we really appreciate you and thank you for, for joining us in this conversation. You're welcome. You're yeah, welcome. Thanks. Thank yes. you all for being here. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Oh, I'll stop the recording.